everybody, and thank you for tuning in and listening to and watching the Real Short Box. This is the Real Short Box kind of live. Uh, I'm Donald, and uh, today we have, of course, uh, Mr. Kevin's here, and uh, we have uh, a couple guests. We have a uh, guest, Julio Galvez, from We Can Be Heroes Comics in Chatsworth, California. Thanks for joining, Julio. Yo. Nice to see and you guys. And we have Alex Banquita from uh, Scout Comics' uh, Headless series. Uh, also Hi. Other things you've been working on. So thanks for joining us, Alex. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited. Super fun. Yeah. Most of us are in these imaginary realms behind us, which is great. Uh, <laughs> Kevin looks like he's in the most trouble, though. He's going to get his head lopped off. Uh -oh. It's okay. It, 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 it could be worse, you know? Absolutely. It could, be worse. It could always Especially be worse. That's yeah. like one of my favorite yeah. drawings in that issue, actually. So. <laughs> oh, wow. That's awesome. Uh, Robert yeah, just I, I, crushed it, and then like you pick one of my favorite pages in that issue. So awesome! awesome I love man. the art. I love the yeah. art. He's the best. He's the best. Yeah, we were talking about it's it's Robert uh, Amand. Amand, yeah, that's how I pronounce it. You know, okay. I, I, it's funny because I've I've worked with Robert for a long time, but I've never actually talked to him on the phone. Uh, we've only communicated through email, so I have really? no idea how to pronounce his name. Oh wow, that that's fascinating. Have you ever like had the desire? Are you like you? Here's my number in case you want to call. And he's like, no, I'm good. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> I don't think I've ever put it out there. I don't know, but he's more than welcome. Um, yeah, no, I've worked with Robert for a long time. Um, he's like uh, he's like my co-pilot in my mind. I don't know if he feels that way about me, but I feel that way about him. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, you both are co-creators of, of this book, Headless, correct? Yeah, and then we also made Captives before that. So, um, All right. And Headless yeah. exists because of Robert. It's I'll, I'll get into that later, but like without yeah, Robert, yeah. there would be no Headless. So. Oh, there you go. Curious as to how you got into uh, writing comics in general. Uh, are we are we are we starting officially now? Did we miss yeah. anybody introductions? Oh, yeah. I, I hope nobody wasn't introduced. Everybody was introduced. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We're, we're, we're good, oh, good I, to go, man. Okay, I just want to make sure. I, I just want to miss anything. Yeah, um, yeah there's I mean, no. No other people here. Okay. I mean, we can reintroduce you as Alex Banquita, the man from New York, the man who currently resides in the great city of Miami, Florida, who's Love wearing it. a cool, you know, Hawaiian T-shirt. I mean, sorry, no, button-down shirt. No, it's like a weird Miami shirt. shirt. It's like there's like a weird <laughs> Miami shirt. I That's see a brand. Miami shirt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, so um, around uh, I want to say like. The mid 2000s, no, mid mid 2010s, I just started to write comics. So I, I also draw as well, but I don't have enough time to draw. And then I started writing comics. And then um, Robert and I, uh, I found Robert's work on a forum and I was working on a book and I kind of reached out to him and I was like, hey, do you want to work on my other book? And he was like, yeah, let's do that. And then we worked on Captives for a while as my self-published book. And then uh, at one point, you know, Robert was like, you know, I, I like this book, but I kind of want to draw something else. And I was like, well, here's an Headless Horseman comic I wrote. Headless Horseman comic I wrote a while ago. Um, I'll just send it to you, and you tell me what you think. And he was like, cool. Let's change this. Let's do this, and let's do that. And that became Headless. And then uh, we pitched the scout, and they went for it. So yeah, without mm -hmm. Robert, there would be no Headless. <laughs> so like, there you go. Give give it credit where credit's due. When did you start Fright the Fright Comics uh, imprint? Uh, I think 2016. Okay, I started so it. Um, I'm very into self-publishing. Uh, it's 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 a ton of work, but I also really like the idea of putting out my own books. Um, mm. But working with Scout has been amazing. Uh, I I love working with Scout. They've been super supportive and they they really um, support creators' rights. So you know, pretty much if if I want to do anything, they're like, that's cool, just do that. They got your they got your back. I heard yeah. they're kind of kind of split like divisions. They have a there's like a, a an imprint that's um, more like East Coast, and then Scout itself I think is kind of West Coast, the main yeah. Scout. So yeah, it's funny it because is. when I well, well Scout Central is actually in Florida as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but when I got when I got picked up by Scout, they had no other imprints. Mm -hmm. And then the imprints came in once Headless Volume One Issue One came out, and then um, but at that point I was like, well. I'm not going to switch over to an imprint. I'm already here, <laughs> so I just keep putting it out. You scout. Right. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. I mean, no, yeah. they're great. As they're long great. as they everybody, keep you, you know, just keep writing it. No, it's great, uh, and everybody at Scout is like super cool, and I, I feel like Scout to me is the next Dark Horse, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Like, like pre, 
like I, I feel like Dark Horse is at a point where they're they're very successful and they're a great comic book company, but they're at a point where they have too much success. And I think as a result of that, they're not willing to take risks. Right. Where scouts want to take those risks. Well, for example, like when I pitched Headless, it was like, oh, here here's a, a Headless Horseman book that's in the 80s and it's blue and pink only. Like, I, I, I just felt like all the companies I pitched that to, they were like, no, that's weird. And S- Scout was like, no, that's cool. Let's, let's go for that. And, yeah. you know, it worked out. Um, so I just feel like Scout is at that, like, pre, like, pre-big Dark Horse phase. So I really love working. Right. It's great. That's They're, good. So mm-hmm. creative freedom. It's beautiful. Right. Is They're it, eager to find uh, individuals that, uh, that, you know, they, they can cultivate and work with over time. No, Did it's you great. With, uh, Char- Char- I think his name is uh, Charlie Stickley. Oh, he's the man. Yeah, Charlie Stickley. Yeah, yeah. he's actually yeah, a co-publisher he's... now at Scout. He did yeah. write it, uh, White Ash. Yeah. Yeah, White Ash. He was just in here a couple weeks ago. Very nice guy. I, I went to uh, this little thing called Comic Book Sunday that uh, B. Earl, the writer of um, the, the new Ghost Rider, Vengeance of Ghost Rider, he writes, nice. and he invited him, and I talked to him there. Very nice guy. Super cool. Um, and he was telling me about how, how, how he reads comics every single day, and he's always looking for new talent, and uh, he's just, just a great kickback guy. We're, we're actually going to do a, a few things with the – we want to grow our children's section, so there's a lot of uh, kid book writers. So funny, funny coincidence. Um, so the book White Ash – uh, mm-hmm. The artist on that book, um, I went to school with him, oh. but I didn't know that. <laughs> so I was at a uh, New York City Comic Con, and I was doing a signing for uh, Headless, and the artist, uh, I know his first name is Connor. I always forget his second, his last name. Um, he looked at me. He's like, "Hey man, I know you from somewhere." I'm like, "Where do you know me from?" He's like, "Did you used to have really long hair? Like my hair used to be really long." And I'm like, "Yeah." He's like. Are you this, this, and this? I'm like, yeah, that's me. He's like, dude, we used to hang out. <laughs> it's so, oh, wow. wow. What school did you guys just, go to? Uh, school of Visual Arts. Oh, yes. 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 So it was it was such a crazy moment. I mean, granted, it's SVA. It's one of the biggest cartooning departments in New York City. But like, still, it was like one of these crazy moments where I was like, I don't recognize you because he used to look a little bit different, obviously, in the past. But like, it was such a wild moment. And then I round out Charlie writes that book. And now Charlie is one of the co-publishers at Scout. Wow. Yeah. But when I started working at Scout, um, he wasn't there yet. So it, mm. it was just, it was uh, James Hack. I always mispronounce his name. And then uh, Jim Pruitt, also James Pruitt. And then Brendan Dean. And then there was another guy. I always forget his name, but like he's like one of the um, like entertainment guys. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I, I kind of, I missed that second wave in the beginning. But now they're all, you know, we have like a ton of, the Scout is growing so fast. They keep adding yeah. more and more editors and publishers. And, and they're great. I, I, I love working there. And I'm, I'm very grateful I got in, I don't want to say really early. I got in like right when they were about to take off. At the right time before they blew up. Yeah. Yeah, because now they're, now they're huge. And I remember even yeah. when I submitted um, Headless, um, they changed all the submission policies after I submitted Headless. Hmm. Hmm. So like they got, you're, they you're got grandfathered waste. in. I, I guess so. I don't know. I mean, maybe nice. when my contract's up, they're gonna get rid of me. I, <laughs> nah, right. don't say that. Don't say that. Maybe they have extended, extend your contract. I hope so. We'll see. If we have any sway, extend his contract. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love working there. They're the best. They're great. They're great. Well, so, I, so I, I want to say, I want to say that I really enjoyed the the book. Uh, Donald sent it to me, and oh, I thank read you. it. And uh, hopefully Donald will send me the rest of them. Uh, you, don't, I, you, don't, I, you, don't, you don't have to say that if you don't want to. Because like, if it's not like, it terrible, you don't have to say you like to. No, no. I, I mean, like, I, I, I try to be honest. I mean, I, I don't read that many comic books anymore. Um, right. Scout actually got me with um, the Knuckle Duster guy. And uh, what is that? Guy? Uh, yeah. What is that book? I recommended it to you, Donald. Yeah, it was, uh, the Knuckle Duster like Skeleton- yeah, the, the skeletor looking guy with the lightsaber. Oh, oh, oh. it's like it's like uh, Dark Star. It's like it's like Luke Skywalker. Yeah, yeah, Star, uh, Star Killer, Phantom Star. Killer. That was Luke Skywalker's yeah. original name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's, so that's a, uh, I forgot I the picked name. It up. Yeah, like Anakin Star Killer. That's yeah, a, like that. the the black yeah. black caravan. Black caravan. Black caravan. Yeah. 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 Super uh, nice I, guy. I, Super cool, by the way. Super oh, okay. Cool. I, I no, really I enjoyed that book. So. I was really eager to pick up uh, something else to uh, to read by them. Um, I'm glad I'm glad I, you liked it. Um, yeah, I liked it. And the thing about it that really got me interested is, is my my kid. He's like, 
uh, telling me all the time, he's all, on, on my costume, I want it to be the Headless Horseman. And I'm like, oh, really? The Headless Horseman? Really? And he was bringing that up for the last couple of weeks. And then I pick up this book and I'm like reading there it. it and obviously, I don't know what it's about. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to find this headless body and it's going to be about that or something. Right. And then, oh, it turns out to be the Headless Horseman. So I texted him this morning. I'm like, yo, you got to read this. You're going to love it. <laughs> Thank you so and, much. No. And then, well, then my wife, my wife texts me back and she's like, why are you recommending books called Headless to the kid? He's 10. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my God, great. Well, you can't, can't you, I mean, uh, season, season two is not for children. Oh, okay. uh, so, yeah. I mean, I mean, it, it's R, right? Like if you look at it, it's okay with you, but, um, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's some rough I mean, stuff in there. I read, I read all four issues myself. There's, <laughs> so there's not really. You, you you don't see any blood, you know what I mean? Like season when, he, two. when he's decapitated, when, when uh, what was it? Was uh, Chris, I think is his Chris. name. Yeah, Chris. Well, spoilers, spoilers. Well, that's right. Spoilers, spoilers. That's right. Spoilers, yeah. <laughs> but but when he's decapitated, like there's no blood there or anything. So I, I was like, OK, so this is like safe enough. You know, yeah. I was I was concerned with Kevin because Kevin's very impressionable and yes. I didn't want him to to see something too violent. Well, so so, so right. it's funny because when <laughs> Headless Volume 1 was in production, I was the one who was like, put, like I wanted it to be like, you know, rated R, basically. Mm -hmm. And Robert wanted it to be for kids. Or maybe not kids. I don't, I don't remember exactly. Maybe but like, teens. He, he didn't want it to go that way. So we like, we agreed on like PG-13, basically. Mm -hmm. And then I looked up all the rules for PG-13. And I was like, okay, I get like one F-bomb, which I don't think I, mean, I even used. No, you don't. And I was like, uh, no, no blood that is like projectile, like blood yes. can't spurt yes, out. Yes, spurt, spurt out, yeah. Right. There's all these like rules, so I just kind of followed the rules for PG-13. Um, but what was funny was uh, when I started, I started doing signings for Headless, and I found the vast, vast majority of the people who were coming to my signings were like adult, adults basically. So mm. I was like, well, if this is a demographic, do we have to keep writing? For people who are under the age of 18 you know and then robert was like you know what it's cool let's just let's just roll with it so in in season two like there's i don't want to say it's like overly violent but like if i feel like having, yeah i'm like I, I, my my feeling is this i'm like if i feel like having somebody's head get chopped off and there's blood we're gonna do that if i feel like somebody's clothes are gonna fall off they're gonna fall off if i feel like dropping an f-bomb i'm gonna drop an f-bomb but it's like i'm not going out of my way it's just like the freedom right. is there because right. I felt like Vertigo for a long time, they tried too hard to push that. Right. Like we have to drop an F bomb in every panel, you know, because we can. It's just like it's just like if it's there, I'm going to use it, you know, when I can. Right, right, yeah. Because the way Volume One, I guess, because you're talking about a Volume Two, the way that Issue Four ends, you know, that definitely an opening for more, obviously. Oh yeah, oh yeah, no, absolutely. I feel like I feel like Volume Two goes in the direction that I want to take the series. Hmm. Um, it's only three issues, but like it, it kind of opens the door where I want the series to go. Okay. okay. That makes now, sense. Now, uh, volume two, did the first issue come out already? No. <laughs> no. Um, so it's funny, is, is this is the weirdest thing about working in uh, comics when you're not the big two or like the big indie publishers is that Diamond has a tendency to put in like shipping dates that aren't correct. Mm. That makes sense. They're like yeah. the book's gonna ship out on this day. And I'm Julio, like, you're you're a proprietor, so you understand. Oh, yeah, so totally. Julio knows what I'm talking about. Yeah, it's it's like I, I didn't know this until I started working there. I'm like, why are they putting this date? It's like, well, that's what Diamond does. And I'm like, but the book's not gonna come out on that date. <laughs> like, but that's what they want to put out there. That, that so what they say? What, what day is it? What day is October? Is October sixth is the date. That was like a week ago. So oh, there's no geez. way it's coming out then. Um, the date we're shooting for is October twenty seventh. But um, we'll see if that happens because, you know, we're all good on our end. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like to put blame on other people, but um, apparently there's like a paper shortage. Oh, yeah. With everything going on right now with the pandemic, there's shortages everywhere on everything. I had, I had no idea. So it's I was not like, because of the pandemic. It's because of the, everything stuck in the port. Chains. Well, supply chains, yeah. They're, they're I, I don't know the what the issue is, but I just found out about it recently. So I was like, oh, well, you know, hopefully it comes out on Halloween. Like. Yeah, trees are on strike. Yeah, it's just, it's just crazy. Like it's just one of these things. Um, you just, you just roll with it. Like. But anyway, I'm glad. I'm glad you guys enjoyed Headless. Um, yeah, it was yeah. a fun read. It was, yeah. it was definitely a fun read. 
Yeah, it had a Stranger Things vibe I got from it, which uh, was kind of cool. I like the 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 era that it's set in because uh, yeah. I can relate. That's my era, and um, yeah, it's it just it, it felt fun. And it, there's a mystery there that uh, starts really quickly. I think most of the time these books today uh, don't pick up quick enough. You know, you, you're finding out what's going on by the third book, and here you go. You have a lot of a lot of detail going on, but it's not so wordy that you're like, Ugh. you know, it, it, you can read right. this quickly and be like, oh, okay, I know where we're at here. And I'm still right. going to be surprised by something. Something's well, coming. It's, it's, it's funny because I feel like a lot of my big writing influences are from the past. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very oh, yeah, heavily, I'm very heavily influenced by people from, I want to say pre-1999 like or, or 2000. Um, and I think the modern writing has this tendency to be like, let's just slowly pace everything until issue 15. Right. Um, and I feel like I kind of come from a writing tradition. I don't want to say I come from, but I'm inspired by a writing tradition of like, we need to say X, we need to say Y, we need to say Z, and we need to do it quickly. And that's, right. that's, that's the hard part. That's very, very challenging to do. It's not easy. It's not right. easy to set up a story and keep the reader engaged and end right. on a cliffhanger. It's very hard to do. Um, so true. like one of my, one of my big influences, uh, Rod Serling. Oh, there we uh -huh. go. Me too. I like that Twilight Zone. I, there we go. I'm obsessed. I'm obsessed with Twilight Zone. And like, when I see that man, right. I'm like, I'm terrible, but I want to be this man. And right. like, he, he's so incredibly good at setting up an interesting premise and hooking you in like two minutes. Right. And that's, that's always my goal as a writer. And then so, the twist at the end. And then the yeah. twist. So like when I wrote one of those this, episodes, they're less than 30 minutes. It's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah, it, it, the, man, it's the man is a genius. He's a genius. And when I uh, wrote Headless Issue 1, I remember being like, I really like this and I really like the ending. You know, it's, it, it hooks you, it sets the story up, and it's, it brings you in. Mm -hmm. And then I remember when I was pitching it, um, I remember hearing from people being like, oh man, this, this ending is, is a good hook. It's solid. Mm -hmm. um, but the challenge was after writing the first issue, I found myself really, really, really having to work very hard to set the story up and keep the reader engaged and tie everything together in four issues. It's, it's, uh, let me put it this way. Like when I see modern comic book writers and I'm like, you can't nail it in 10 issues. Mm -hmm. It's embarrassing. Like I feel, I feel well, embarrassed for modern writers. If you want to be in, embarrassed by uh, writers, just look at, uh, you know, like uh, any of the Netflix Marvel stuff. <laughs> I, I, haven't, I haven't watched any of that stuff. But like for me, oh, that's not true. I watched Punisher and I watched like the first, I think, five episodes. Yeah. And I remember issue, I remember watching episode one. I'm like, really good. Mm -hmm. And then as it went on, I'm like, where are we going? Right. Yeah. So that's the point. Yeah. Anything that they told could have been told in, in six episodes. Yeah, and they, they expanded it to thirteen for like absolutely no reason, really. Right, and like I don't, I don't, I, I try not, I try hard not to like be negative on other creators, but I, I don't know if it's coming from editorial or from people above. But I'm like, people don't want to wait fifteen episodes to get the story started. Like right. it's it's too long, and I right. get it. It's it's easy. It's yeah, people easy. have options these days. No, it's like it's like I, I I we're we're all anybody who you guys are creators too. You know, like. We're all competing with Facebook. We're all competing with social media all the time. So like TikTok, you name it. Oh, I don't yeah. it actually comes down to this for me. I don't think I feel entitled to other people's time. Right. So it's like I don't I gotta have earn to, it. I gotta earn it. I gotta earn your time. Right. I have to I have to entertain you. So if I'm gonna drag this out for 20 issues, it, it better, better be good. good. It better be it interesting. Better be like right. now, granted, I used to love Dragon Ball Z. I still love Dragon Ball Z. It dragged everything out. But I kept watching it <laughs> because I loved it. You know, it's like it's like Akira Toriyama. You know, he won me over. I'm like, I will watch 20 episodes of the Planet Frieza exploding. It's fine. I'll watch because because I'm into it. You know, so right. Cowboy Bebop. Lot, that was well done for me. One of the best. Oh, it's a, that that's like Citizen Kane of anime. Like it's that, like, that, that got in and out. You know, that was pretty quick. They they told the story that they wanted to tell and then boom mm -hmm. you know I, I think what's I think kind of what I'm getting at is that I feel like a lot of creators are very self indulgent right and they think what they find entertaining everybody finds entertaining and my go to is I assume nobody finds what I find entertaining 
and I try to end it quickly. Like, so for example, in Headless, the character of Claw. Yes. For me, he's incredibly self-indulgent. Claw's the, the demon character. The, that's de the demon character. The demon character. Every scene with him for me is incredibly self-indulgent. I find that's it true. funny. It's incredibly corny. It's over the top. He has corny one-liners. But I try to end all his scenes quickly. Right. right. Because I'm like, this is for me. He's and basically then, evil Ash, is what what I always thought when I was reading it. I, I can, yeah, it's funny you say that because I can see that. And what's funny is that when I started looking up reviews online, and again, reviews don't represent how people feel, you know, who read the book. But like the few reviews I saw, everybody was like, Claw is the best character. Claw has the most character development. He goes, so it was like one of those weird <laughs> things. I'm like, so when I'm the most self indulgent is when you're into it. Is that is is that kind of thing? But. Mm. Now, yeah. Sarah, I find to be, to me, the most sympathetic character. You're really going to like season two, then. <laughs> okay, good, <laughs> just, good. Now, for those, those that are watching, Sarah is uh, one of the deputies in the town in, uh, I think it's what, it's it's uh, Salem, Massachusetts, right? Yes, yeah, Salem, Massachusetts. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Who has a secret, who has a secret. <laughs> yes, yeah, she's, she's one of the deputies there, and uh, yeah, she's got, uh, she's, She's got something going on besides being a deputy. A deputy. And right, right, involves right. involves her father and ties to um, the Knights Templar and things like that. So right. there, there's a lot of layers here that we're we're dealing with. But but for those that are that are listening and watching right now, let's give them the the kind of overall synopsis of this story. So to, if you're kind of pitching it to people that are listening or watching right now, what would you say? about this story so that's 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 it's hard to do because i don't want to give things away um but right. i would say it's a headless horseman story set in salem massachusetts based on the salem witch trials um connected to the 80s with a tendency to have twists hmm. I'm, I'm gonna use that right uh, i okay. like that i like that all right yeah, work. That sounds too long, actually, but I feel like that's... It's good enough, it's good enough, it's pithy, I, I, that's pithy I enough. It's one of those, it was it was one of those books that. that, like, I had to literally, I felt like, um, you always see those, like, parodies of people who are conspiracy theorists, where they have a giant whiteboard? Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> yeah. what it was like when I wrote Headless Volume 1. It was like, thing X leads to thing Y, like, because there's so many things that are connected and layered into everything else, so, like, I literally had pages of notes where I would have to be like, okay, did I address thing X? Did I address thing Y? Did I touch on thing Z? Because there's so many layers of what's going on. And then also there's this thing going on in the story where it's like, you don't want to focus on certain things for too long because it holds the story up and you want to keep the reader engaged. So like, it, 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 sounds, it sounds borderline neurotic, but like, it's there's so much going on that like, it was a very intensive book to write for me same thing with season two but season one especially like there's so many things going on there's so many characters there's so many elements of the story that it there was so much side work that was going on and also it's also right. based on um like things that happened during the salem witch trials right so do you guys know who giles Corey is and like he was a real person yeah i, I, yeah, I, I heard of found out he was a real person after looking it up but uh right. oh. first i didn't know at all so it was like this this guy who just was accused of witchcraft and he refused to admit he was a witch and then he was killed and i was like wouldn't it be cool if he was the headless horseman ah. and then he was a witch and then he became the headless horseman because the devil turned him into the headless horseman i'm like that's really cool and then he comes back to salem massachusetts and he's obviously pissed off you know? so i was like that's a fun idea um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it was, a, it was a very fun book to write, but for me, like my first outing being published, it was a very labor intensive book to write. Yeah. Mm. Um, uh, question about like, uh, with, with like, for example, we, you had the character Claw that you very much loved yes. and, um, I enjoyed Claw as well. I loved his puns and stuff. I thought he was very funny. Uh, like <laughs> I, I, I'm happy to. Yeah. Um, as far as like, uh with his character this isn't going to spoil too much but he he morphs into uh, the horse he's that, the horse yeah that basically the the headless horseman rides upon yes it's like, now it's like the evil version of a cringer that becomes battle cat <laughs> there you go. Yeah. yeah so so basically my thought is on this i want to know more like was he always the horse? Was like, is is yeah, there? Yeah. What, what was his life before? Are we gonna get a one shot claw issue? Yeah. 
you know what's origin funny? Story, that, origin story. I've gotten that question multiple times. And again, it's like one of these characters, I'm like, this character is X, this character is Y, this character is Z. And everybody is like, explain more. So I feel like it's gotten to a point where I, I might actually just pitch a one-shot claw story to kind of get in. Because he's, he's, he's a demon. He's from hell, you know, and, and then if you get in. For you. I'm sorry? Uh, I have an idea for you what his origins could be. I'll tell you off, offline. No, no, no. <laughs> tell me. No, tell me. No. Let's, let's, let's tell me. Tell me. I, was, I was thinking like, you know, maybe in his, he was a human being before, before no. he became, or he wasn't ever a human being before. I'm going to say X. Yeah. He's, okay. he's never a human being. He's always okay. Okay, I, I thought maybe he could have been a human at one time and then, you know, got transformed into a demon at, at a later point in life. No, I, but like, I, like, I like where that's going, but just for this character, like, especially the way I write him, he has no empathy whatsoever. Okay. okay. He's, he's completely devoid of any human empathy. He's, he's a monster. He's, he's okay. literally a monster, but he's a 100% monster. percent evil. He's evil, but he doesn't understand human emotions. He's like, I can just kill anybody because why not? It's, why it's wouldn't fun. I do that? Like, it's fun. It's fun. It's hilarious. <laughs> so it's... And the character of Tom is like that as well, which is weird because he used to be human. Mm. Gotcha. And then he gets he gets worse as season two progresses as well. Worse, but like you really see the character come out in season two. Okay. Yes, sir. And, and, and I definitely enjoyed a twist with that with, with Thomas as well. Well, that was what I guess for me, like where I'm grateful is that I remember when I started writing, I always heard this quote, like, start with the end and work your way backwards. Right. So yeah, like, that's, a, that's good advice. So I knew, I was like, this is where it's going to go. This is what's going to happen. Um, I remember I was on one podcast and the, uh, the person running the show, he was like, I see this kid on the cover and he's this punk bully kid. Why is he on the cover? Right. He must be important. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no comment. But like, mm -hmm. he's like the main antagonist of the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> No, no spoilers there. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I just feel like I keep like unraveling everything. And somebody's going to be like, oh, I know where the story's going. But. <laughs> I, think, I think what I liked about this uh, after reading reading all four issues of the, of the, the first series is that I like the fact that in my head, I've, I'm exploring ideas. Instantly. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, and like, I agree. I'm thinking, yeah. okay, so he's coming out with a, with a, technically you know I, I guess a part two and so i'm thinking well that looks just judging that looks like a continuation of the story so that's going forward and i and then i thought again well what if we went backwards what if we saw uh you know other incarnations of exactly character and mm -hmm. and how that ended we know how each one basically ends but the but there's one in which uh in the book, and it's not really too much of a spoiler, but one of one, at one point in time he commits uh, the, the horseman kills himself before the Knights Templar can get to him, mm -hmm. and I kind of want to know that story. You know, I want to see that play out and stuff. Right. So it, it's it's interesting you bring that up because that to me is something I always explore in my head because what's what's fascinating about the way the story came together is that the character of Chris. All right, spoilers. Chris is the headless horseman. But he's like a reincarnated version of the Headless Horseman. So right. it never ends. And it gets to a point where the character, the, the person who is the reincarnated version of the Headless Horseman becomes the Headless Horseman. But sometimes they commit suicide because it's so uh -huh. stressful they can't handle it and they kill themselves. And that's right. what happened to the previous version of the Headless Horseman who was born in like the 60s. So he killed uh -huh. himself. I think, what, what was it? I, mean, I think the character was... 15 or 16 so he may actually maybe he, he killed himself in the 60s then because chris was 16 in the 80s so yeah but like the idea is that this is a the characters like, this is this is a character who's had so many past lives and it gets to a point where you have almost multiple personality disorder um and that's an interesting thing to write as a writer because the current, ver the current version of the Hellish Horseman is somebody, spoiler, who manages to survive the whole thing. As, uh, as being mm. the vessel, as being the vessel for the yeah. Hellish Horseman. Right, he's, he's, he's the Hellish Horseman, but he somehow managed to not turn into him through various circumstances. So now he has to deal with the reality of your old memories are going to come back, your old personalities are going to come back, 
all these horrible, he's literally been to hell. So it affects him as a person. And he's just a kid. Right. Right. He's only 16 years old. So, right. you know, it's, it's in the, it's in the description of headless season two issue one. So I'm willing to say it. He's suicidal in yeah. season two. He wants and, to and who wouldn't be in real life. Who wouldn't be right. He he's, he's riddled with guilt. He's has to deal with the fact that he's a PTSD. murderer. PTSD. Right. So, and then you have a character like that, and then you have this conflict because he has to interact with his brother, who is like basically like the Captain America character. Yeah. He's like yeah. Boy Scout, straight shooter, and and he's he's trying to. It's like evil Ghost Rider on in his end. <laughs> right. Like, like his brother is trying to deal with the situation, but he he can't he can't relate. He doesn't understand, and he's right. trying to understand, and that's but he where can't, the conflict. He can't understand. It must be nice to have a therapist. It must be like a therapist can come in that that, that kind of understands right. these. Uh, <laughs> and there are and there are through. like that's kind of what's interesting to me about the the way the story is structured because I feel like the only characters in the story who understand how the main character feels are horrible people. Right. right. Like Claw understands he doesn't care. Mm -hmm. right. Tom yeah. understands he's a monster. So the it's devil, like, the devil understands. Devil he understands, <laughs> but he's all about it. So it's like, and then Sarah understands. But she's dead. Spoiler. <laughs> she's dead. She goes to hell. Spoiler. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Poor Sarah. Um, like Kevin but then again, now, now that you said that, though, I feel there's more I to Sarah. You, you, since you opened that can of worms, that's why I was asking about Sarah. I think I think we, we might be seeing her again. She comes well, back in season two. I'm just saying it now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she goes, I, think, I figured that. I didn't think her story was, was closed. Donald was saying that he was like envisioning things, different directions that you could go with it. And, and as you were talking, it would be interesting to see if Chris would, you know, now he's, you know, gotten through all that and he's suicidal and stuff. If he's going to stop another horseman from coming into play, you know, another that's, vessel that's, being taken over. Like maybe that's, he, he's, that's, what's, that's what's going to keep him alive, even though he's all down on himself and all messed up in the head. He's like, well, I can't let this happen again. So he's going to, you know, hunt or find out who's going to be the next person right that's right. going to become the next horseman well the, yeah. well, the way the way this story works is that that he's if he dies then he will be reincarnated oh, as the next okay. it's, not, it's not that some other person it's it's, okay. it's him All so right. whatever happens to him directly affects the future but again oh, i think i think now, now that's we're all into spoiler territory now yeah. <laughs> so I think what's interesting for me is writing the character is that this character has such a huge burden on his shoulders, but he's way too young to yeah, deal yeah. with it. To carry it, yeah. Right. And it's it's too hard to carry, and he's gonna make mistakes, and he's gonna do things he shouldn't do, and he's and it, as a result, which is I think hard to write for me even at times, is he's gonna make mistakes that directly hurt other people. That he's not aware of at the time, you know. In this case, Which, in this case with extreme power comes extreme responsibility. Right, can't. but but it's it's kind of one of these things where it's like mm -hmm. you're born into a situation that you never wanted to be born into, and you find out it's it's oh it all actually it almost links into the the concept of original sin, right? That, but to an extreme level, mm -hmm. where it's like you are born into sin, you are sin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And now you have to deal with it. It's, it's the bloodline, yeah. So you're kind of stuck with it. And yet, in this case, he chose not to eat from the tree of knowledge. He was basically born of the tree of knowledge in this case. Right. Right, exactly. And, and there's all the spoilers for everybody. <laughs> so it's just, yeah. It's basically, uh, so for for those listening, and in, in not, not to create confusion, since we've released some of these spoilers already, um, Chris becomes a headless horseman by the the prodding and pushing of uh of claw who basically had i, I believe given him a a mixtape of some sort right mm. yeah that, that's how they do it every person who's a vessel they're they're always reminded as, as a way to trigger it right I, so right. in this case in the modern I, age it was tape, a, i would imagine yeah uh, film and tape that's how they trigger way it. each time depending upon the time right. whatever can work so that didn't really take so uh the most aggressive manner that he could do then was just to to lop his head off and to show him that look it's not even attached anymore look you're you're the headless horseman look at you right. where you are right. and that then freaked him out of course 
and he's like, oh my God, I'm, I'm the headless horseman. And then he's, he's fighting throughout the whole series. He's fighting with himself, with, with his destiny, so to speak, and in trying to prevent that from happening. But the headless horseman, all that, 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 that past is coming back and it's encroaching and it's, and here's his kind of memories and here's the headless horseman kind of overriding that and taking him over. And now he's, he's just there for the ride, basically. Well, it becomes tragic. It becomes this interesting idea of, are you responsible for if, again, if you're opening the idea of if reincarnation exists, are you responsible for things that you've done in the past? Right. So it goes into original sin. Sins of the past. Sins of the father, right? Sins of the past. And then it goes into the idea of if you are, what can you do to remedy it? But again, this is somebody who is not even an adult. He's not even an adult. And then he's surrounded by a support structure who is trying to deal with it in different ways. Because his brother is trying to save him, but other people are like, no, we're just going to use him for these means and kill him. Mm -hmm. Right? So it's like all these different things are going on in the environment and i think what makes the story interesting for me is like the the dynamic i think the most interesting element of the story for me is the relationship between rick chris and sarah you know it's like you have three different sides and chris is more of the person who's along for the ride trying to deal with this problem right Um, but there is there doesn't seem to be a solution so, so, so Rick, Rick is uh, Chris's older brother, and he's right. uh, brother. a deputy sheriff, I right. believe, along with Sarah, who's mm-hmm. also a deputy sheriff. Um, and they're in the, all in the town of Salem. Rick and Chris had just moved there not long ago yep, right. uh, because Rick wanted to go there to work. He he wanted to work in right. Salem, and it, it, he didn't know it at the time, but he felt kind of drawn to it. Right, mm-hmm. and that's yeah. what Sarah said. It's it's in your lineage. It's in your DNA. No matter what happens it's not your fault because no matter what you would have been drawn here right. some way somehow well so i think i think again this is worth mentioning i think I, I think it's obvious maybe when you when you realize it when you read the book i, I went to catholic school for a long time me yeah. too me too <laughs> then you know what i'm saying yeah so I, I feel like one of my the most interesting things about catholicism was this conversation i don't know if it connects to catholicism but we talked about my religion class of predeterminism versus free will Right. And I think this book really touches on that concept that you are predetermined to do a certain thing. But can you change that pattern? And it gets Modify into free- it. alter the right. path. Right. And that I think that's what the that's a lot of what is hmm. floating on the tier and the edges of the book, which is something that it's I cool. find very interesting. It's cool. You know, the Matrix movies obviously discuss things of that right. nature. It's always good to have that kind of thought process because in life, we do ask ourselves, am I just predetermined to be whatever I am in life? Am, am I just inevitably stuck in this position right. or do I have the ability to alter my path? And I feel yeah, like it's, it's, it's things like that to me that give the book. Um, I, I like to, when I'm, when I'm writing, I call it meat, but uh, I, I would call it heart, right? Like there's, there's something there about the book that gives it a, a human element you know, something that kind of relates to people and connects with the human condition. Mm. Um, and then tying into what I was saying earlier, and that's how I feel about Rod Serling's work on The Twilight Zone. You know, it's like there's something sure. about, yes, that's a cool hook. Yes, that's a cool story. But there's some human element to this that is kind of at the heart of the story, you know. Mm. And, uh, and, and and Rod Serling had like a crazy life. Uh, the guy was in World War II. There was World War II. He right. saw a oh, lot. That's right. Right. I mean, I, I have none of that. <laughs> like, I'm this like, you know, in, in from his perspective, like I'm this like privileged, spoiled peacetime guy. So it's I can't relate to the same things he's talking about on that level. But I feel like the more I get into his stuff and other kind of creators from the past, because I'm very obsessed with creators from the 50s and the 40s and the 30s, because I feel like they've been through some stuff that yeah. I can't relate to. And H.P. Lovecraft, you know? <laughs> I love H.P. Lovecraft, yeah. Edgar Allan Poe. Um, I feel like when I read enough Poe, I start to lose my mind, which is good. Because um, he, he will drive you. I feel if you read enough Poe, you will, you will go insane. Like, there's something about the guy, like, that will just drive. I know H.P. Lovecraft is in the idea of, like, people driving you mad, but I feel like Edgar Allan Poe drives you mad. If you read, like, if I remember reading um, the famous one, where, like, the heart. Raven? I mean, 
Not not the Raven. The Telltale, Telltale Heart. Heart. The Telltale Heart. I remember reading that and being like, I feel like I'm losing my mind reading this book. <laughs> you know, so yeah, totally can understand that. Um, let's 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 pivot quickly though before we have to uh, wrap this up. I just want to want to bring up uh, a few things. Now you have done some other work. One of them I'm I'm looking at right now on my screen. It's uh, American Mythology Productions. Beware the Witch's Shadow. Night frights. That's now, a fun what's, book. What's quick? Did you do? Is it uh, so? It's an anthology. Uh, am I correct? Yeah, yeah. So I, I've uh, I want to say this year I started working for American Mythology and I was writing a lot of like short stories for them and anthologies. Uh-huh. Um, that's literally me just having as much fun as possible. Um, the story in Beware the Witch's Shadow, uh, Night Frights, it's one of those things that's so absurd and ridiculous, it becomes funny. Um, oh, every everything I put out with American Mythology is literally me just like having yeah. as much fun as possible. It um, seems that way because you also have uh, Victor Crowley's Hatchet, Halloween Tales 3. Looks like you've so, worked on that also. So much fun, yeah. I worked on that, and then I also worked on a Scary Christmas 2. Um, uh-huh. And what's cool about that book is I actually got, my story got the cover, which is really exciting. Nice. So and that's coming I, out uh, December, right? Somewhere yeah, like yeah, December. yeah. So I, uh, I'm really grateful to get to be working there. And um, I remember um, uh, the people over American Mythology, they were like, uh, pitch us some ideas and what I love about uh, working with them is that like literally I just come up with the stupidest idea possible that I think is funny and then at American Mythology like that's really funny go with it so there's there's a gelling there nice. um, I would say as a creator in general I'm very spoiled because um, everybody I've worked with whether it be Scout or American Mythology and I have another book coming out from a different publisher I can't say yet because the book hasn't come out um, it's always been like, just, just do you and just have fun and do the thing you want to do. Um, that's, beautiful. And, that's, and that's an incredible beautiful thing. thing. It's a blessing. It's a beautiful it's thing. It's amazing. Yeah. And, and I feel like if I've ever been, if I ever get offered work at like, you know, the big two or something like that, I almost question if it's going to work out because I'm, I'm so accustomed to having very minimal editorial, uh, oversight. Not, yeah. not a lot of oversight. And I just, I feel like one day if I'm working on you know, let's say one day I'm somehow working on Batman or something like that. Right. I, I just feel like it wouldn't work out. I, I just feel right. like I would write something. Unless it's that. a one shot, they might give you a little freedom, like a, a Maybe. weird one shot. Maybe. Yeah. But, it, it, you know, we're talking, we're talking control freak Warner Brothers here. So yeah, 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 yeah. I, don't, I, don't, black, I don't DC black label else world story. I don't know. I've had friends that uh, all they've ever dreamt about was to go work at the big two and got there and, and we're completely unhappy yeah, yeah i don't i i came into comics actually from manga oh okay so oh was, okay beautiful i'm sorry no so that's great that's beautiful you came oh yeah from manga. so uh, uh, yeah so like i got in i was really into anime and i was really into manga and then i started reading american comics um but i i kind of come at it from this perspective so manga is very creator owned creator centric mm-hmm. and when you start getting into like the big two and all that kind of stuff. I think for me, like it's, it's not something I've always dreamed of doing. It's, it's not that important to me. Um, if I was given the opportunity and it was appealing to me, I would do it. But I just feel like my biggest fear is heavy editorial. Um, and, and then I think, I feel like even as a writer, like I've heard horror stories where writers basically don't write their own books anymore. Mm. Where like the editors write the books. That's terrible. They just yeah. put they put their name on it. You can see that. Yeah. yeah but that's uh, terrible. you know, I'm I'm glad that you've had the opportunity to to have this freedom and I hope you continue to. And and I just want to take this time to thank you for for being on here with us uh, sure. at the real short box. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Um you have uh plenty of work out there right now, American Mythology, uh and you have uh Scout and then another publisher coming soon it sounds like. Uh right. Guys, check out Headless. Uh, volume one is already out. Uh, all four issues. You can find that uh, through Scout. Uh, you can also, I'm sure, find it uh, at some of your local comic book shops and on Comicsology. I believe has uh, has it as well. I don't. I don't know. I heard it's coming out in Comicsology, but I don't okay. know if it's there yet. All right, so it'll be coming out if it's not there already. But it's on uh, its way. If it's not, Volume two is coming very soon of Headless. And uh, you've got a, a, a Christmas uh, issue that's going to be coming out from American Mythology. Uh, and that's in December, of course. 
and uh, much more and hopefully more more growth for you in more future projects. Uh, thank you again, Alex, for being on. We really, really appreciate it. No, well, thank you for having me. No, it's been a blast. I love it. So much fun. Cool. And hey, for, Alex, when you're on the West Coast, uh, stop by We Can Be Heroes. We'll set up a signing or something. Absolutely. That would, that would be a blast. I would love there to go. Yeah, yeah and, we'll, and, and we'll have to go drinking or something. That yeah. sounds awesome. That's the, we'll that, that sounds even now I'm extra interested in coming. <laughs> <laughs> be great. Yeah, All right, guys. Great. All nice right. Well, thank you, man. you, everybody, for listening. Uh, you can find us on YouTube uh, on Mondays. Usually we have a live uh, podcast that we do from 7.30 p.m. on until whenever we decide to end it. Uh, and we do have an audio podcast. We are coming up on our 200th audio podcast episode, so stay tuned for that. Uh, you can find us on all popular podcast platforms. Thanks again, Alex. And thanks to you, the listener, for listening to us. Uh, if we don't see you out and about anytime soon, we'll see you at the bewildering, crazy, and sometimes disturbing comic book shop. Okay. <laughs>